hello there, and thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. This week, we'll round up several recent items from the Port Hawkesbury Town Council table. We'll also update you on some big developments for green hydrogen in Point Tupper. And you'll hear one local volunteer firefighter story about how the recent February deep freeze might have caused a disaster at the Nova Scotia Community College campus in Port Hawkesbury were it not for the quick thinking of volunteer firefighters and Port Hawkesbury's Public Works Department. But we'll begin with the first segment of an interview with Nova Scotia's Finance Minister. It's almost provincial budget time, so Inverness MLA Alan McMaster is once again a busy man, but he also has some thoughts about the recent health care deal signed between Ottawa and the provinces and territories, and the forthcoming carbon tax that's going to impact several aspects of your daily life beginning this July. So let's begin our conversation with Inverness MLA Deputy Premier and Finance Minister Alan McMaster right now. And we're pleased to join in the middle of a very busy stretch for him, the MLA for Inverness and also Nova Scotia's Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance. We welcome back to Tell Ill 24-7, Alan McMaster. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Adam. Well, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to hit the ground running. You are now building towards your second budget as finance minister, the budget for the 2023-24 fiscal year. You provided a budget update not long ago, and it looks an awful lot like Nova Scotia could be in a surplus position, or at the very least it is at the present time. Can you give us a few basic breakdowns of where we are and what you're looking towards as you finalize the budget for the coming year? Sure. Well, people will remember last spring we introduced a budget that had a over half a billion dollar deficit. And the big reason for that was because of a focus on trying to fix the health care system. And um, what we've seen since then is uh, significantly increased tax revenues. Uh, we get updates from the federal government throughout the year. Some of this is because of um, our population is increasing. A lot of it has to do with the fact the economy, and I realize it's not been an easy time for many people, but the economy has been doing much, much better than expected. And some of this is, is trailing revenues uh, that, that's coming in from the past. So um, essentially the last two budgets, governments have tried to predict how much revenue is going to come in because of the pandemic and all of the disruption that's caused, uh, just one example is, is automobiles. For a, for a pretty lengthy period of time, it was very hard to find an automobile. You drive by a car lot, there'd be hardly any cars on it. So there were supply chain breakdowns. And that was the case in, in a lot of industries. We see it in the construction industry as well. So what we've seen is an economy that's done better than was expected. And we're starting to get information from uh, Statistics Canada uh, that's showing population's been increasing. It's, we've got information from CRA that's showing that more income taxes are being paid and so on. More corporate taxes are being paid because the economy has done much better than expected. So in December, the big story was we had an extra $1.3 billion, uh, which is going to reduce that half a billion dollar deficit down to about $140 million, which is still a lot of money. We're still overspending, spending more than we're taking in. Uh, but we've made a lot of investments this year in healthcare and in other areas. And I think we're gonna talk about a couple of small investments closer to home here in, in a little bit, but um, that's that's where we're at and, and that's where we've come from. So let's pick up on that conversation about healthcare spending. And we are just days removed from the Prime Minister and the provincial governments and territorial governments across Canada signing a new deal that will cover healthcare transfers for the next 10 years. Can you give us a couple of thoughts from your perspective as finance minister as to how this is going to impact not only Nova Scotia's bottom line, but on your government's various commitments to healthcare? Well, I would say, uh, you know, picture a $5 bill. So every time the $5 bill is spent on your health care, $4 are coming from the provincial government and about a dollar is coming from the federal government. Mm. Uh, with this new deal, the federal government's giving us an extra 10 cents. So it's not a, it's not a massive boost in the arm, <laughs> uh, but it is something. And we'll certainly take whatever we can get because we need it. 
Uh, healthcare is the most important service that your government delivers for you. And we've certainly been making the investments. We've been, we've been overspending, uh, introducing deficit budgets um, to try to fix health care. And uh, this is a little bit more money that, uh, that will help. So we're, we're trying to be grateful for it. <laughs> but it's, you know, it is what it is. You know, on, on $5 of spending, this is an extra 10 cents. Um, one concern that I've been hearing from people is, you know, one of the requirements to get the money is that we share health data with the federal government. And people are concerned about, you know, giving up personal health information. And, you know, what could a government do with that information? Well, we're not going to be sharing anyone's personal health information. Um, we will be sharing information, but on a higher level. And it's more so to help to monitor uh, how the healthcare system is doing. How successful are we at reducing surgery wait times? Um, how successful are we um, improving healthcare in rural areas like the area we live in? So we don't have any problem with that. I mean, we, we want that information ourselves. We're happy to share it with the federal government. I think they want that information because they want to hold us to account uh, because the provinces run the healthcare systems, the federal government's. They set some standards, but they don't actually run the system. Well, I wanted to pick up on that, if I could, Alan, and ask you a bit about a comment recently made by the Premier, your leader, Tim Houston, at the Nova Scotia Progressive Conservative Party annual general meeting. And he said that fixing health care, those were his exact words, still the top priority for the province and for the provincial government. And he said we would do whatever is necessary in terms of spending. And I mean, you've just mentioned now deficit budgets to be able to improve the healthcare system. Obviously, still some struggles. So you talked about surgery wait times. Uh, Nova Scotia just found out that the number of people waiting for a family doctor has risen 4,200 plus over the past year, now sitting at 133,000. So can you speak a little bit to the concept that this is a team effort on your government's part that you're speaking constantly with the minister, Michelle Thompson, with the premier himself and with the various healthcare stakeholders. Can you talk a bit about that as you head forward and try to make the best of what's a difficult situation right now? Yes. Uh, well, as finance minister, um, my job is to try to ensure that the revenues are coming in to pay for all of these needs in healthcare. And um, we want to make sure we're investing the money prudently and that it's getting results. And you mentioned one statistic there on, on doctors and Nova Scotians that they're doctors, and that number has been growing. And a lot of people said, well, if you're fixing the system, you're not doing a very good job. You know, um, we're not afraid of the numbers. We want, we need to measure and we need to make sure that we're getting improvement. Uh, no one wants to be spending more money and not getting more improvement. So, um, the, the system has been under strain for years. I think if you talk to anybody who works in healthcare, they will say that they've felt overwhelmed within the system. Uh, so that's been going on for a long time. Now add to that, our population is growing. We've seen the largest population increases, largest numbers of people coming into this province since the 1920s. Uh, and I think a lot of people were coming back in the 1920s, you know, when the, when the Great Depression was starting, and people were getting back to the land because there was no money to be made in, in the cities or certainly the jobs weren't there like they used to be. And people were basically coming back to live off the land. I know my, my uh, father's parents did exactly that um, after, after the stock market crash in 1929. So uh, our population is increasing. Um, it's, it's good and bad. It puts strain on housing. It's gonna put more strain on the healthcare system. But the people that are coming here um, are potentially the solution to the problem as well. Um, healthcare doesn't just take money to fix it. It takes people to fix it. We need more, we need more of everything. We need more doctors. We need more nurses. Um, so we need people. And that's one thing that's harder for the government can, to control. I can spend money. I can hand money to Minister Thompson. Uh, but she still needs people. So we've, you know, we've been doing things like free education for anybody who wants to become a continuing care assistant. Uh, we've also given them a, a significant raise with the hope that they feel more rewarded for the work they do. Um, the premier has personally uh, made an offer to any 
uh, anyone who's becoming educated as a registered nurse in the province, that as soon as they're finished, they will be hired as long as they have their licensing and whatnot. So we're doing everything we can on that, on that part, but um, it's, it's not as easy to find people than it is to spend money. You can go to the bank and get money. You can't go to the bank and get people. Mm -hmm. So I think human resources has been probably our biggest challenge. Um, and uh, it is a real key to solving and fixing the healthcare uh, situation we have before us. Shifting gears now, Alan, I wanted to catch up with you concerning the coming imposition of a federal carbon tax in Nova Scotia beginning this July. And this is something that you and your government had fought against and tried to present alternatives to the federal government in terms of going ahead with this type of carbon taxation. So we're at a point now where we're getting ready for this and we're getting ready for impacts on everything from the price of gasoline to the price of home heating oil. Your thoughts on your government trying to deal with this situation and the people of Nova Scotia trying to deal with the situation. And the flip side of it is, does this help your bottom line and the province's bottom line at all, even as these new programs come into effect? Well, we're, we're dead against the carbon tax, uh, but the federal government has made it law. and We've done everything we can to protest it and to, um, to encourage people to write to their members of parliament uh, to tell them how they feel. Um, what this means come July is that people are going to be spending an extra 14 cents per liter of gas. Mm -hmm. And in just seven short years from now, they're going to be paying uh, an extra 37 cents per liter for gas, mm -hmm. for their gasoline. So I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who wants to pay that much more for the gasoline. I mean, 10 cents more is a big deal. Um, let alone in a few short years, uh, well over 30 cents more per liter. So we're against this. We don't see the point. The, the whole purpose of it is to get people to stop buying gasoline and stop buying home heating oil. Um, so the problem is if people don't have an option to choose something else, they have no choice but to pay it and suffer with the higher cost. So, um, you know, people may be able to move to electric cars, but electric cars are expensive and not everybody can just turn around and buy one. There's there's been somewhat of a shortage of them, I think, over the past year. Uh, in terms of home heating oil, yes, people can switch out. We're offering grants to get people uh, into heat pumps. Uh, but we also know that uh, power rates are there's there's stress on power rates because in this province, uh, we still burn a lot of coal and the price of coal has gone up 400 uh, percent since uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So all to say a carbon tax is not going to help us. Um, it's going to make things more expensive. I don't understand at a time when people are already dealing with inflation, why the federal government wants to make uh, things that we need more expensive. And I'm not just talking about gasoline and home heating oil. Picture a farm uh, that's growing something that requires fertilizer. Well, fertilizer has petrochemicals, and uh, that is going to attract carbon tax. The tractor driving around the field has got to be fueled. That is going to be attracting carbon tax. When the, the crops are loaded onto a truck to take to market, that truck is going to be paying carbon tax. Uh, when you drive to the market to pick up your produce, you're going to be paying carbon tax. Um, when you come back home, if you have a propane stove, you're going to be paying carbon tax to cook your food. So just on food alone, look at how many times you're going to be paying the carbon tax. And yes, the only time you're going to be paying it is maybe for your stove and your car. But guess what happens to the price of the food that the farmer is selling? And guess what happens to the price that the truck driver is, is uh, the cost for the truck to take your food to market? And guess what the market is going to be paying to heat the store unless they have uh, electric heat that is produced with something other than coal or natural gas? They're going to be paying carbon tax for their more carbon tax for the heat. So all of these things are going to make the price of your food more expensive. Mm. Um, if people had options, you know, okay, fine, make it more expensive. People will move to the other option, but it's not that simple. 
um, because the options aren't there. That's what we need are the options. And we could be trying to move to those options without a carbon tax. That's the case we made to the federal government. They weren't listening. They wanted the carbon tax come hell or high water. So now we're stuck with it. So come July, 14 cents more for gasoline. Are you paying even more than that on more carbon intensive things like home heating oil? And in a few short years, you're going to be paying 37 cents a liter more for your gasoline. Now, with all that in mind, Alan, you mentioned the program to allow people to get onto heat pump technology, and we've seen that over the past couple of years. That being said, taking all this into account, uh, higher gas prices, higher home heating, oil prices, propane, you mentioned Nova Scotia Power and the power rates and the Utility and Review Board just approving massive power rate hikes over the next two years. Does that boil down to a need for financial relief for Nova Scotians? And is that something that you and your department are looking at in this upcoming budget? Most definitely. Uh, you know, some people are better equipped to deal with rising prices. Nobody wants to pay more for anything. Uh, but some people are, are, are more equipped to deal with that. If they're working in a, in a job that they're very well paid for, if things go up, you know, they can shoulder that. But there are a lot of people out there who can't. And they are the people we must be mindful of. Uh, we've been very focused on providing targeted supports to make sure that they help those people. And the most recent one that we did was around home heating. And you can get a, a heat, heating assistance rebate now of $1,000. We, we multiplied it times four. It used to be 250, now it's $1,000. Mm -hmm. So people, if they're, if they're hearing your, your broadcast, they should most definitely explore that. Um, it's also, we've also expanded the threshold. So any household that is under $85,000 of income will be eligible for this. Um, so uh, we're trying to help more people. Um, the other thing for seniors is the Seniors Care Grant this year. It was a new program that we started. We started it off at $500. We boosted that by another 500. So that's also $1,000 that seniors may be eligible for. So those are two, you know, concrete ways we're trying to help people deal with the cost of living. You'll hear more from Inverness MLA and Finance Minister Alan McMaster later on in this episode of Tell Ill 24-7. Right now, let's go to Port Hawkesbury, where the latest regular meeting of town council heard from a representative of a business based here in Nova Scotia that's designed to encourage conversation between would-be entrepreneurs and those trying to start up a small business in the province. It's called Mashup Labs, and it's based in Lunenburg County. But you don't have to travel to Lunenburg County to take part, because it's set up as a virtual discussion group for those trying to set up their own business ventures. Several straight area residents are already taking part. There's even a full virtual cohort that's based out of Guysboro County. You're going to hear more about this from Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton, who spoke about the presentation by Representative Andrew Button at the latest regular town council meeting for Port Hawkesbury. But you're also going to hear about some interesting developments for the Nova Scotia Community College that are also part of starting up new businesses, particularly in the Mi'kmaq sector. So here's Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton talking after the latest regular monthly meeting of Port Hawkesbury Town Council and telling Telil 24-7 what she thinks of the concept of mashup labs. I thought Andrew's presentation uh, was wonderful um, and certainly Port Hawkesbury is no stranger to pitches uh, or entrepreneurship or encouraging some new, new entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, as I was listening to uh, his cohort proposal in terms of mashup labs, of course my mind immediately went back to start up for Hawkesbury. Yeah. Um, so certainly um, we have asked Andrew to come back with a little bit more information in terms of you know what could a cohort uh, specifically for Port Hawkesbury potentially look like or where my mind kind of goes is Port Hawkesbury is a service center for the Strait and you know we we are servicing 20 to 25,000 people daily um, so I think it would be pretty cool to kind of have more of a regional um, a take on on a potential cohort or a series of cohorts um, from according to the presentation they take 15 people per cohort um, I think it's wonderful um, Port Hawkesbury is definitely open for business um, you know we're really 
really great town. We we love uh, hearing about new entrepreneurial ideas as well. I think another another idea that we didn't mention this evening at the council table, um, but was kind of twigged in the back of my head, um, was our new Port Hawkesbury development uh, committee that has. Um, not had a first meeting yet, um, but this is something definitely uh, that we can kind of punt over to them uh, for their consideration because perhaps they might like to work sp uh, directly with Andrew in Mashup Labs. And then another uh, idea that kind of popped into my head as, uh, as uh, I was just reflecting on that presentation was a bucked place and our innovation center. Um, so the potential partnerships with Mashup Labs with regard to a bucked place and NSCC. Um, I think any program uh, at NSCC, the Straight Area Campus and Nautical Institute is only made better uh, when you put that entrepreneurial lens on those programs. Um, so there's another potential partnership. So I think there's all kinds of interesting leads um, and directions that the, this particular presentation can potentially go in, not only for the town of Port Hawkesbury, but in the Strait region in Cape Breton and in Unamagi. Now you've just heard of a new development at the Nova Scotia Community College Strait Area Campus involving Mi'kmaq students. So how did it get started? Where is it? And what does it do? Here's Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton again to explain. A Bucked Place is actually uh, an innovation uh, center that um, is par in part partnership with NSCC, uh, but located in the former Creamery building uh, down on the waterfront. And right now, um, the space is somewhat ready. We still have some technology up updates and upgrades uh, to, to uh, left uh, to be completed. Um, however, it's kind of a blank canvas in terms of, you know, what that innovation space could be cultivated into. Um, ocean safety, oceans innovation, uh, a buck is actually Mi'kmaq for sea. Um, so yeah, so we are, we're envision, envisioning uh, a marine-based innovation center, but that uh, doesn't forego um, any opportunities with entrepreneurship um, or opening it up to any anything, really, any like mashup labs, you know, um, lots of spin-off opportunities that could be marine-based, but also could be not at all. Meanwhile, back at the Port Hawkesbury Town Council table, Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton and her fellow councillors learned about the participation that's already taking place in the Mashup Labs concept. While there isn't an official Port Hawkesbury cohort for the Mashup Labs training, such as the one recently set up involving the Guysboro Business Development Association, there are as many as 15 Port Hawkesbury participants in the online cohorts for Mashup Labs. And this news really didn't surprise the mayor. That did this not surprise me, it, particularly so because uh, when we did start at Port Hawkesbury back in 2017, um, we had a massive, um, like we had an abundance of people coming forward um, from the town and from surrounding areas uh, to participate in that startup Port Hawkesbury um, contest. So not at all surprised. Uh, that there were already names of, of participants in cohorts from the town of Port Hawkesbury. Um, we are a very entrepreneurial town, and like I mentioned earlier, um, Port Hawkesbury is open for business. Um, we love welcoming new businesses to town, so uh, definitely um, something that I, was, I really enjoyed the presentation that Andrew made this evening uh, with regard to Mashup Labs, and I think there's huge potential for partnerships in the future. Now in that last segment, you heard about new developments at the NSCC Strait Area Campus in Port Hawkesbury. Well, now you're going to hear from a town councillor who also happens to be an NSCC faculty member and a member of Port Hawkesbury's Volunteer Fire Department. His name is Mark McIver and I spoke to him after the latest regular council meeting about an acknowledgement he made during the meeting about quick action by volunteer firefighters and by Port Hawkesbury Public Works crews after the deep freeze that we experienced just a couple of weekends ago resulted in some potential water damage over at the NSCC Strait Area campus as a result of some freezing happening in its sprinkler system. Here in his own words is Port Hawkesbury Town Councillor, volunteer firefighter and NSCC faculty member Mark McIver to tell the story of what happened. On uh, Sunday, um, the Port Hawkesbury Fire Department actually responded to a, an alarm at the school, which uh, was a result of a frozen uh, sprinkler line and domestic lines were also frozen. And on, we had called, we were called in 
um, four o'clock ish on Sunday. We did uh, clean up, got the water shut down to a point where we could handle it. And on Monday morning, we had to have, or actually, I'd uh, requested the uh, works department to shut the main off so that we could get the pipes cut uh, for the domestic lines and uh, patched. And uh, they responded very quickly, and we were up and running by 9.30. And so it went very well. Our maintenance department had it pretty much cleaned up, and we had a uh, plumbing outfit in on uh, Monday morning. There has been some damage, flooring, um, walls, bathroom, uh, ceilings which are in the process now being fixed. However, Councillor McIver feels this damage could have been much worse were it not for the quick actions of Port Hawkesbury volunteer firefighters and the town's public works department. Yes, everything went very smoothly. And now we're going to hear from Provincial Finance Minister Alan McMaster once again. This time, he's going to shed some light on a recent announcement that he made in conjunction with Cape Breton Council Member of Parliament Mike Kellaway concerning a multi-million dollar funding announcement to help straight area transit by new accessible vehicles. Here's Minister McMaster to tell about why straight area transit is a priority for his government and for himself in his own Inverness riding. I just wanted to get your thoughts on the importance of having these vehicles available and how they can impact not only straight area transit and its riders, but the community in general. Well, uh, I think having transit, you know, people who live in cities, they can take the bus, you know, they can take the subway. Um, our answer to that is straight area transit. And it's, it's something that uh, I think people who, who use it appreciate it. It's a, it's a very affordable way to get around. And people who haven't used it yet, uh, with things like the carbon tax coming, you might want to think about it. Uh, it's a good option. And um, it's, it's a way that governments are trying to support people in rural areas to get around. So whether you need to get to an appointment or whether you need to get your grocery shopping done. Uh, but also something I think about, um, we have a lot of seniors in their homes, uh, sometimes a lot of women who, uh, whose uh, spouses have passed on. Um, and if they're by themselves at home, um, this is also a service that you can use to go and visit others. Uh, or for people to come to visit you. So I think about the important uh, social aspect that straight area transit can bring for people in terms of getting people out to see each other. And um, some people say, well, that's not really essential, but you know what, I think it is. I think it's just as essential as going and getting your groceries uh, to be having contact with people on a regular basis. It's good for people. Um, I get a lot of it in my job, <laughs> uh, but not everyone gets to be out with the public as much uh, as, as some of us who are going to work every day, you know. So uh, I think that's something that's good for people to keep in mind that this is a way to get around and it's an affordable way to get around for many things. It's interesting to know, too, that your time in provincial politics, you were elected in 2009 in a by-election to the riding of Inverness almost a year to the day after straight area transit officially launched in 2008. So you've gotten to see the impact not only within Inverness County, but also within the town of Port Hawkesbury now included in your riding. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, it's, um, I know it's, it's critical for some people in terms of getting around and it's, it's why the government continues to support straight area transit is because it, it, it can work for people. And um, it's, it's important that we, we make sure that it, is, um, that it is working as efficiently and effectively as it can be. Um, and I'm always open to hearing from people how they feel about the service. Um, we are a funder. We're not an operator of the service, so we don't directly control it. But we want to be funding it and we want to make, be making sure that it has the resources to work effectively for people. Municipal councils here in the Strait area and around Nova Scotia are trying to figure out what to do now that Nova Scotia's Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing has shut down housing authorities across Nova Scotia, including the Cape Breton Island Housing Authority. The announcement was made this past October by John Lohr, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and municipal councillors in Port Hawkesbury are trying to figure out what that means when town council and similar municipalities bring up their housing concerns. 
Here's Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton to explain what will happen next and how Town Council is going to deal with it, not just in terms of dealing with a new province-wide housing authority, but in setting up a municipal department to deal with housing issues on their own. So as a council, we didn't really take the time to really dig in with regard to the information that was shared in under the this new authority. Um, however, um, I did invite council if they did have any concerns or any questions uh, that, I, that I would be happy to vet them um, with the province and so that we could seek out some answers. I know one of the questions that we had this evening was around um, the would, would the current um, offices continue in, in the different locations throughout the province. Um, so that's something we may have to find out a little bit more information on, for example. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I do understand that the province was wanting to, to may perhaps streamline, um, you know, take another look uh, to explore the communities that each of these offices are working in, um, take a look at the province overall and to see, okay, you know, maybe we have to try something different uh, to expect different and want uh, to achieve different results. So um, this is definitely a big change uh, and time will tell to see where, what direction it takes the province in. In the meantime, Port Hawkesbury is still pursuing its own housing agenda through a new department set up within the structure of the town. Now, you may recall earlier on Tell Hill 24-7, Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton was speaking about Port Hawkesbury development. That was originally Port Hawkesbury's new Department of Economic Development and Housing. Here she is to explain why these two seemingly separate topics are bundled into one new development department. So we uh, had, of course, connected to Port Hawkesbury's strategic priorities. Um, for the first two terms of, uh, of, I guess it would have been from 2020 to, to the tail end of 2022, um, we had one dedicated committee for housing, Port Hawkesbury um, Housing Advisory Committee, and then we had a Port Hawkesbury Economic Development Advisory Committee. Um, so we found there was a lot of redundancy in terms of discussions around housing and having, um, particularly in our Economic Development Advisory Committee, um, housing being a barrier to new businesses, new businesses springing up, and and you know just a, a lack of, of workforce and being able to retain and, and attract workforce. Housing seemed to be that one thing that was superimposed on onto everything, uh, whether it's an opportunity or a challenge. Um, so what we are planning to do for the next two years, the, the remaining two years of the term, is to kind of hyper-focus on housing as an economic opportunity uh, for the town of Port Hawkesbury. So our new committee is really essentially both of those committees morphed into one and it's called Port Hawkesbury Development. Um, so we will be looking at housing but housing won't be the only thing we'll be focused on of course. Um, we can look at um, this opportunity for mashup labs, we can look at you know, promoting the town as a place uh, that's open for business, uh, that welcomes new entrepreneurs uh, and Perhaps, you know, maybe there's some synergies around a bucked place down on the waterfront. So there are all kinds of potential directions. There hasn't been a initial meeting uh, for that committee yet, um, but I'm sure there's lots of exciting things to come. Just a few moments ago, I spoke to Inverness MLA and Finance Minister Alan McMaster about a funding announcement made for straight area transit that also involved Cape Breton Council Member of Parliament Mike Kellaway. Well, the two men joined forces for another funding announcement just a couple of weeks later. It took place in Port Hawkesbury, and it involved spending millions of dollars to replace some aging water infrastructure in the town, including the town's aging water towers. During our interview for Tell Hill 24-7, I spoke to Minister McMaster about why he feels this is important for the town of Port Hawkesbury. Wanted to get your thoughts on the recent water infrastructure announcement for the town of Port Hawkesbury. This impacts water that's being used not just by residential customers, but also commercial customers and industrial customers in nearby Point Tupper. Your thoughts on the importance of the province being involved here? Well, it is it is important because uh, we're going to see a couple of wat old water towers taken down. Um, nobody wants to have old, especially water towers. They're pretty large pieces of infrastructure hanging around beyond their useful life. So they're going to be removed. I think that's good uh, for the look of the community. Uh, there's going to be a new water tower erected. So that'll serve the community for many years to come. And uh, there's other associated uh, water infrastructure. 
uh, pumping station and, and so on. So uh, this is money well spent in my mind. Uh, it's helping uh, the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, anybody who lives there is going to benefit from this and anybody who might live there someday. It gives the town an ability to uh, welcome more residents. Um, you need this kind of infrastructure for people who are living in, in more densely populated areas. It's not like you can just put a well and a water and a, and a, a septic field in your backyard if you're in a town. So there is a lot of value to it. And um, it, um, I'm just happy that Port Hawkesbury is getting this. And uh, I'm, I'm really big on infrastructure investments like that because uh, there's something that it's, it's taxpayers' money uh, that is going to pay dividends year after year into the future uh, for that community. We've covered a lot of ground in our conversation, as I thought we might. Alan, did you want to add anything else all about all of this just before we wrap up here? Well, Adam, as always, you, you cover a, a, good, a good deal of ground here. And um, thank you for the questions. And I always enjoy coming on Tellio with you. And I uh, want to wish your, your, your viewers well. And uh, know that we're, we're working hard to try to make things better for them. Well, we appreciate with all the balls that you're juggling right now, uh, you're giving us some time this morning and whenever we've caught up with you for Tell Hill Community Television. So thank you once again, Minister Alan McMaster, for joining me today on Tell Hill 24-7. Thank you, Adam. Take care. Alan McMaster is the MLA for Inverness and is also Nova Scotia's Deputy Premier and the Minister of Finance. Now we'd like to tell you about some major developments on the green hydrogen front for the Point Tupper Industrial Park. Bearhead Energy, formerly known as Bearhead LNG, recently held a series of open houses around the Strait area to talk about its environmental assessment pitch to the Nova Scotia government regarding the company's plans to develop green hydrogen at its Richmond County home base. And just a couple of weeks later, the environmental assessment approval came down from the provincial government for Everwind Fuels, which is set up at the former Stacia and New Star Terminals property in Point Tupper. You're going to hear from the CEO of Everwind Fuels, Trent Vichy, in just a couple of minutes. But first of all, here is how Brenda Chisholm Beaton, the mayor of Port Hawkesbury, reacted to the Everwind Fuels approval and the developments being proposed by Bearhead Energy just after the regular monthly council meeting for Port Hawkesbury at the Civic Center Shannon Studio. I think it's absolutely wonderful news. Uh, we, we do have a, a really great opportunity around um, green hydrogen and, and really making a, a major footprint here in the Strait area in Nova Scotia and really Nova Scotia on behalf of all of Canada nationally. It's, it's a, quite the opportunity um, to be global leaders. Um, so it's, it's wonderful news to hear that, um, that this milestone has been reached uh, on behalf of Everwind. Um, certainly all of the green hydrogen proponents uh, that are that have their eyes set on the straight um, you know I think it's just it's it's just going to create um, that critical mass that we need uh, that's going to bring new opportunity new innovation uh, jobs um, looking at delivering energy that is green um, that's going to get us away from coal and fossil fuels so I mean th this is all positive news um, and yeah so I guess we'll keep our eyes to the future to see how things continue to progress. Port Hawkesbury's mayor also praised Everwind Fuel CEO Trent Vichy and the team that surrounds him for their communication with town officials. Oh, listen, they have made it so easy. They are so accessible, um, willing to share information, uh, not just with our municipality, but with the community in general. Um, you know, I, I honestly, it's been a wonderful communication uh, with uh, all of the pro proponents uh, of Everwind. Um, yeah, like there's really nothing I can say other than, you know, tremendous compliments. Um, they certainly offer, you know, if we want uh, updates, they're, they're willing and able to provide those. But oftentimes we get updates without even wanting to or having them prompted. So, no, it's great. No complaints there, only compliments. Wonderful news to hear that um, that this milestone has been reached uh, on behalf of Everwind. Um, certainly, all of the green hydrogen proponents uh, that are that have their eyes set on the straight. Um, you know, I think 
It's just it's it's just going to create um, that critical mass that we need. Uh, that's going to bring new opportunity, new innovation, uh, jobs. Um, looking at delivering energy that is green. Um, that's going to get us away from coal and fossil fuels. So I mean, th this is all positive news. Um, and yeah, so I guess we'll keep our eyes to the future to see how things continue to progress. The provincial approval for Everwind Fuels came just a few weeks after another Richmond County-based company, Bearhead Energy, held open houses about its own strategies to produce green hydrogen and green ammonia in the Strait area. With these two companies now working on their own plans for this new energy source, Mayor Chisholm Beaton feels there's a new optimism in the business sector in Port Hawkesbury and the general community that hasn't been felt in nearly a quarter century. I think that there's a lot of positive energy uh, in the community, uh, not just in Port Hawkesbury, but in our surrounding communities in the Strait and in Cape Breton. Um, there's lots of engagement going on, uh, certainly the different open houses that have been hosted in Port Hawkesbury and in surrounding communities have been well attended. People are asking great questions, you know, getting really excited about the future. Um, and I mean, the future is like certainly bright and it's it's just so wild wide open from training opportunities to to job opportunities you know the opportunity to grow our population here um, the opportunity to participate in the green energy paradigm shift globally so it's just it's so exciting on so many levels uh, and again you know as things progress um, as municipalities we need to be prepared to figure out you know how do we participate how do we you know contribute uh, to making sure that we are ready for growth in each of our communities. So um, in general, um, it's great to see the community um, excited, asking great questions. Um, and yeah, we have amazing comparative advantages here in the Strait of Canso, and I could speak all night uh, with regard to those, um, both natural uh, assets as well as uh, built assets. And um, yeah, looking forward to the future on many fronts. Here at Tel 24-7, we're currently working on securing follow-up interviews about the latest green hydrogen developments with officials from Bearhead Energy and Everwind Fuels. But in the meantime, we thought it was worth revisiting an interview that I did with Everwind Fuels CEO Trent Vichy this past fall, talking about what green hydrogen actually is and why Point Tupper is such a good spot to be able to develop green hydrogen and green ammonia. Here are some highlights from that interview with Trent Vichy for Telil 24-7 right now. Everwind Fuels announced that it was setting up shop here in Point Tupper back in May. What has the community response been since that time? So the uh, the response has been good. I'd say, you know, a few questions around, you know, what's, you know, timing and what's, you know, how, how the various processes work. But uh, one overriding uh, response we've been getting is like, well, how quickly can you, you start to build and start to get this thing going? So we are working uh, around the clock on that right now. So we're focused. We'll talk a little more about that timeline later on in this interview, Trent. But right now, I wanted to ask the basic question, why Point Tupper? Why did this area and this site appeal to your company? Yeah, so what I'd say, look, in terms of uh, producing green hydrogen, um, the most important thing is the lowest cost of renewable power. And what that really means is uh, the best you know, like renewable resource. And in the case of uh, this area, you have a, uh, one of the best wind resources in all of North America. So we've, um, that was part of a key part of the, se uh, the selection of the site. You've got great wind here and there's a way for us to sort of, you know, benefit together and um, to, to build, the, uh, build the project and um, take advantage of what is just a natural and um, renewable resource that'll be here for, you know, a long time. In terms of this actual location, it's been here for a long time and developed a solid reputation through the Gulf oil refinery years, through Stacia terminals into the New Star ownership just prior to your arrival here. What made all of this work for Everwind Fuels? Yeah, so the most important um, aspect of uh, you know developing and building these projects is um, developing out the marine infrastructure. And so the marine infrastructure and the port that we have here is the deepest ice-free berth on, you know, I think it's on the east coast of North America. Um, it does take a long time if you were to build a greenfield site to actually go through the permitting process, planning, etc. And by um, selecting this site, you know, we save that time. And why is that important? It's really because um, 
what's going on in the green hydrogen space globally is there's a lot of parts of the world that want to do the same thing as, as we're doing here. And by selecting this site, we're able to start the process and actually get into production a lot faster. Um, so it was really the existing infrastructure. The other thing which is uh, really important as well is you need a team. And so the team that we've got here on the site is uh, fantastic. It's got the best safety track record of any business I've ever seen in my entire 25 year career. More so than that, it's a local team. And there's, uh, when you have a team that is local, they know all of the, um, uh, the things that you need to do business with and all of the they have the relationships the local knowledge and that is uh, important in terms of like making the business better but also like managing risk in the business as well um, so it's the team was absolutely critical and, and we've been thrilled with um, how things have been going so far you've already mentioned green hydrogen a couple of times and I know that the priority project for Everwind fuels here in Point Tupper is the creation of green ammonia for our viewers that might not understand all of this, what exactly do these terms mean and how will the production of green ammonia proceed at Everwind Fuels? Yeah, absolutely. So how you make green hydrogen is uh, through a process called electrolysis, which sounds fancy, but what it is essentially is it's running a current through uh, water and water is H2O and that process breaks the water into H and O. And if you use renewable power for the electricity source for that, that's green hydrogen. And in terms of how green hydrogen fits in with green ammonia, uh, ammonia is actually NH3. So it's um, hi uh, hydrogen and uh, nitrogen. And the air that we breathe is 80% um, nitrogen. So the way the process works is you have an air separator unit, uh, unit which grabs nitrogen from the air. We have uh, green hydrogen coming from the electrolysis process and it's put into uh, essentially a, 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 like a large pressure cooker. The process is called the Haber-Bosch process, which was uh, invented by the Germans back uh, in the early 1900s. Um, but you put the nitrogen from the air, the hydrogen, and then NH3 comes out. Ammonia itself is essentially, for the most part, farm fertilizer. And it's really um, essential to life on the planet today because when you put the, um, that fertilizer on, the, on, the, on farms, the production you get from the land is uh, close to doubles. And so one of the things that I've heard um, or researched is that um, without the uh, ammonia as a farm fertilizer, you'd actually have three billion people less on the planet today. Like it is that, it's essential to life. In terms of uh, how it's being produced today, um, it's the same process, but the hydrogen is coming from natural gas. And so natural gas is CH4. Um, so they break apart that uh, CH4 into the hydrogen. Unfortunately, what that does is it, uh, it leads to CO2 emissions. And so for every ton of uh, ammonia today, you produce a CO2, two tons of CO2. So it's one of the um, largest CO2 emitters in the, in the world. So our opportunity here is to take um, power from the wind, uh, nitrogen from the air and water to make renewable uh, fertilizer that uh, doesn't have a carbon footprint. So from the point of view of yourself and your company, you feel that you're essentially turning a negative into a positive. That's exactly right, yeah. So what are the tools available at this specific facility here in Point Tupper that allow the green hydrogen and green ammonia processes to take place? So the site itself is 1,400 acres, so there's more than enough room to put um, the electrolyzer units, which are uh, essentially, they're, they're put in um, large buildings, sort of, you know, call it, you know, 40 meters by sort of you know 100 meters long almost like a warehouse from from the outside so the electrolyzer is there you put the ammonia plant um, next to them and then in terms of what's here it's really the port asset so the piping will run down to the port so that it can be put on uh, boats for um, you know transport to its end, end markets um, and also you've got a, an on-site sort of operating safety team to uh, operate the, the, the facilities there so you've got the core infrastructure here um, you've got uh, water that's you know, within the site boundaries. You've got um, power that we can um, from transmission close close by. So it really has all of the things you're looking for. It also has rail on the site that's uh, usable, road access. It's really an in interconnected hub. And as you're developing a business, having those uh, logistics uh, interconnections are you know critical. 
So this all gives us an example, Trent, of how green hydrogen and green ammonia are produced and how it can be produced here in Point Tupper. But can you give us a sense now of the market for green hydrogen and green ammonia? Are you looking nationally? Are you looking globally? What does Everwind Fuels have in mind for what it's producing here? Yeah, so I'll talk about green ammonia. So today, uh, ammonia is 180 million tonnes per annum. of. Uh, so it's a very, very large market. The first phase of this project will be around about 200,000 tonnes. The second phase, a million tonnes. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very large and well-established market. With regard to green hydrogen, well, hydrogen today is mostly used in industrial processes, refining and other, other things. <clears throat> the use of green hydrogen is more about the new uses. So uh, today you're starting to read about um, hydrogen fuel cell cars and trucks. And um, so that is one of, the, one of the things that we'd like to do over time is to be a green hydrogen supplier here in Nova Scotia. And fundamentally, you can't be buying or um, green hydrogen trucks and cars without a green hydrogen supply. So it's really about breaking the chicken and egg so that we can further decarbonize Nova Scotia. You mentioned, Trent, that this is going to be a two-phase process in terms of producing green ammonia here at the Everwind Fuels site in Point Tupper. Can you give us a sense on the timeline for those two phases? We plan on starting construction um, you know, a little, you know, around uh, the end of uh, Q1 of next year for that for that first phase, and that will that construction period will run for about two years uh, before we start uh, producing. You know, sort of the start of 2025. Any projections on how many workers you'll need for the construction phase? Yeah, so on the on the first phase of the project, um, roughly around 500 people for on the construction, um, and then more for the the larger larger second phase. Since Everwind Fuels arrived in the Strait area in May, your company's made announcements about a couple of partnerships with Mi'kmaq communities in Cape Breton and northeastern Nova Scotia. Can you tell me a little about these partnerships and why they're so important to you? Yeah, and it's just the start of a process, but we, um, we've got um, investment agreements with uh, Member 2 and uh, Button Keck as, as part of the project. And you know, we're just at the start of this, and so we'll be um, sort of engaging across, across the board you know, a really big part of engaging is actually figuring out what, you know, what we can do and what, you know, what's needed. And um, so it's it's a listening process as well. It's a communicating process. And we've been doing that since, um, you know, February, March. And like, we'll continue to do that for, you know, quite some period of time. We're, we're looking for um, further engagement. We've been hiring or engaging or hired um, different um, First Nations owned businesses, um, for example, 3D Wave that uh, will produce the image that uh, you, um, you'll show. Um, we've we've done cultural training here at the site, but the, it's look it's it's not a checkbox. It's a journey, okay? It's a journey over a long period of time, and that's that's what we want to do is just you know be consistent and really sort of help um, some of the First Nation communities around here, you know, meet their objectives, grow economics, like you know, what, 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 the things that are important to them, you know, and we're like, it's, we're listening and seeing what we can do to, uh, you know, help their objectives. And I understand your company's looking to bring on more Indigenous workers and partnerships as it proceeds with the Green Ammonia Project. Absolutely. And so we've got meetings with, um, you know, various communities and chief, chiefs that, uh, that are happening over time. And um, we've been reaching out for the start of the project and we'll do more of that work uh, on a continuous basis. More, there's more to do. Like this is not the, where we are right now is just the start of the story. Trent Vichy, as the CEO of Everwind Fuels, you really seem to be looking ahead to this with quite a bit of optimism. Can you explain what you're feeling as you stand on the cusp of this new development? So I feel pretty good. So what in terms of um, there is a very strong demand in the market right now. Um, the, the situation that's happening with, in um, Europe right now with the Ukraine situation has driven a huge amount of demand from uh, European buyers. Um, they're having you know real difficulty in terms of getting like power supply sources, and so they're desperately trying to um, get whatever um, you know power they can get. So LNG is sort of um, finding its way there, but the German and the European market, they really want uh, clean fuels. They're trying to decarbonize as well. So they're, the demand there is very, very good. In terms of the, um, the process so far, the community and I'd say the, the province and the, and the federal government, the policy is incredibly supportive. And um, 
So I, I say we feel really good and it's really just working through all of the fine details of making sure that we've checked all the boxes on all of the things that need to be need to be done. We've covered a lot of ground here today, as I thought we might. Do you have any final words for our viewers in terms of how things are going and what we could look for in the future? Yeah, I think uh, what we're doing here is just a wonderful opportunity to sort of, again, draw st strengths from the region. So we're focused on making sure that the benefits are here with locals, the employment, the jobs and the skills are, are, are here. You know, the other thing I'd say, just as a general observation, is um, the people of Nova Scotia, are, I, I say, are like very tough, smart, independently minded people. And that's that's actually what you need to survive in sort of the broader world today. And, and I've seen a number of world beating champions come out of the region. And I've come to the conclusion that it's because you just have such an amazing um, sort of strength and intelligence of, of the people here. But also they've grown up in an environment where, you know, independence and, and that go get a problem solver attitude is, is uh, is rewarded and needed to, to survive. So that's why you've seen it. You've, you've seen successful Nova Scotians go out into the world. And part of the project is the folks who have been, um, you know, forced to go to the west part of Canada to work. Let's bring them back. You've got this amazing skill set. Let's bring it back here where they can come home and deliver the benefits for the community. And so I think uh, this this business should hopefully be a start of a green industry in Nova Scotia. We really want us. Uh, we really want to sort of drive the benefits here. You've got an amazing resource and we just want to bring it, to, we want to bring that to life. So Everwinds, we view our role as a, as a catalyst to start that process. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Talil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in. And a big thank you once again to my interview guests this week, Brenda Chisholm-Beaton, Alan McMaster, and Trent Vichy. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen or heard over the past hour here on Talil 24-7, or you'd just like to make some suggestions for future editions of the show, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863. And you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an E, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your suggestions and your comments. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928. And the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. Don't forget to follow Talil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And our YouTube channel features every single edition of Talil 24-7, including this one, as well as our sister program, Roundtable, and individual segments and interviews from our shows. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me here on Tell Ill 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.